It's an absolute honor to be on this stage with Lord Alf Dubs for the occasion. And to give you a bit of context, the Worldwide Tribe podcast aims to amplify voices of people or voices that often, too often, go unheard. Stories of migration, people that are caught up in the refugee crisis, whether that be as volunteers, like many people here who have worked in the space, or whether people have made the journey themselves. For example, Gowali here at the front, he's been a previous guest on the podcast. It's a very good episode. And talking of incredible stories, Lord Alf Dubs, you have one of your own. And I know you just touched on it briefly in your welcome speech, but maybe we can start with what happened to you in 1939 when you were six. Uh, okay, well, I lived in Prague. Uh, what happened was my father was Jewish, my mother wasn't. And my father said, if the Nazis come, he's going to get out. And his cousin said they'll take their chance, and they were taken to Auschwitz in 1942. So there was something really, really powerful and horrible happening. But my father, my father left. My mother was then refused permission to leave. And so she put me on a kinder transport run by that wonderful Nicky Winton. And so, but I was luckier than most because, um, you know, I had somebody waiting for me, family waiting for me at, at Liverpool Street. But before I left, um, you know, the Germans came in, and in, in, the, in the front cover of my school book, there was a picture, picture of the Czech president, President Benish. We had to tear that out and stick in a picture of Hitler. So there were things, things like that which stuck in my memory. And then my mother seeing me off on the train, it was a long train journey, two days, hard wooden seats, but as a six-year-old, you don't notice that. I, I didn't eat anything. I, I, my mum had packed some sandwiches in a little, a little pack. I, I hadn't touched them. And um, when we got to the Dutch border, the older ones cheered because they knew we were out of reach of the Nazis. And uh, I, I just knew it was significant, but I didn't know why. And then we got to across Holland. I was looking for, uh, looking for windmills and wooden shoes. That's all I knew about <laughs> Holland. I didn't see any. It was dark. And we got to the Hook of Holland and then Harwich and then to Liverpool Street. So wow. that, was, that was a journey. But I was luckier than most. Some of them never saw their parents again. Uh, and some of them, the parents connected up with them later. Uh, so in one sense, I, I was lucky because I, I had a father, father in London. Uh, he died soon after, but I had a father in London. And then my mother, who was refused permission, managed to escape at the last minute. So I had my mum my mom look after me. Great, because many people, or many of the children that were with you, they were the only people from the families that actually survived the war often, right? That's that's right. I think a fair number, a fair number, never, never, never saw their parents again. So there was a heartbreaking scene at the station in Prague when my mum and all the parents were seeing their children off, and uh, most of the parents, I think, were just saying to themselves, "We may never see our children again." So yeah, it was. It was I, you know, I was six. Uh, I didn't understand the significance of that, but uh, I still have a vision of my mother standing there with a friend. Uh, looking very anxious, and German soldiers with swastikas in the background, and that, that was before the train left. And what was amazing to me to read is that you were one of over 10,000 children that came to the UK in that time, and actually there was no cap, there was no number on how many people or children the UK wanted to accept at that time, right? There was no limit to this program. Well, there were 10,000 that came on kinder transport from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. Of course, the limit was reached when the war started and all that, all that came to an end. But uh, there wasn't, I think, quite the fuss that is made now about refugees, which is a sad comment, although I, I still believe most British people support the idea of child refugees if the argument is put to them. But certainly 10,000 of us came and 669 from, from Prague under, under the auspices of Nicky Winton. So from that point, how did you then come on or become a lord? How does one become a lord? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, Sounds so good, doesn't it? Well, I tell, okay, okay. Can I, can I put it this way? I, when I was about 13 or 14, I became passionately interested in politics at a time when most of my contemporaries wouldn't have been. And I was, I think, trying to remember what I felt at the time rather than what I wish I'd felt. Uh, I think at the time I felt that, that something awful had happened uh, evil men in politics had done dreadful things, and maybe politics could also be used for the better. So my ambition was to, um, uh, oh, I was interested, and then my ambition became to become a local councillor, uh, and uh, which I managed. And then I had to go, and I got into the House of Commons, and I became MP for Battersea, and then I lost that, 
and, and then eventually they put me in the Lords, which is a sign of political life after death. But the thing about the Lords is it's an opportunity to do things. You know, you know I, I worry about the Lords not being elected and things like that, but it is an opportunity to do things if you, if you get there, so I've tried yeah, to do that. A platform, and you really have. I mean, most people here and many people will know you for the Dubs Amendment, right? And that was an amendment to the Immigration Act in 2016, initially. And am I right in thinking that initially that, amend uh, that um, amendment was for 3,000 children? Yeah, there's quite a story about that. <clears throat> uh, look, we heard, I think through Save the Children, that there were 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe, mm -hmm. mainly in, 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 in northern France, in Greece and Italy and 10,000 of them had disappeared, according to Interpol. And that's shocking, you know, if one child disappears here, we all go hunting and it's desperate. And yet, <coughs> yet there were uh, 10,000 just disappeared. Anyway, so I put down this amendment. I got help and advice from people and colleagues in the Commons. I put down the amendment, and then I was asked by the government whether I would withdraw the amendment. And there came, Theresa May was then the Home Secretary, and she summoned me in to see her. And uh, I've talked about this, but I'll repeat it. And um, she wanted me to withdraw the amendment. Uh, I said, but why? Uh, these children are living in desperate circumstances. I mean, really, it's dangerous, they're vulnerable, it's horrible for them, awful, awful. And she said, no, if these children come, others will follow. So I said, we can't turn our backs on them. So I, I refused to withdraw the amendment. And then it passed, um, it, 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 it passed in, 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 in the Lords. It was narrowly defeated in the Commons. Some of my friends in the Commons said, sit, and, sit in the public gallery and give them the eye. I'm not sure what giving them the eye meant, but I glared at them. <laughs> uh, and um, anyway, and it, but we had to drop the 3,000 figure. Uh, this, is all, this is total parliamentary gobbledygook. Do you want it? Yeah, Parliament, absolutely. Really Give it to me. Give me all the gobbledygook. <laughs> anyway, so the original amendment had 3,000, which seemed to be the UK's share of, of the 95,000. Most people said it's too small a number anyway, but there we are, we, we got it, we got it there. And, we had, and then when the amendment passed the Lords and got to the Commons, the, the, the government said they invoked something called financial privilege. It's basically, if the Lords pass an amendment which involves expenditure, then the Speaker says it's got financial privilege. And normally, Normally, the, the government waive it and so there's a proper debate. But there wasn't a debate. They just used that as the argument. The speaker told them off for that. And we had to drop the 3,000 figure. Uh, so we just had to have a statement of support for child refugees. So we go back to the uh, Lords, passed by a bigger majority. And then a wonderful thing happened. Public opinion became aware of this. I think the th things on television, like that little Syrian boy drowned, Alan Curdy, mm -hmm. drowned on the Mediterranean beach. That was a big turning point, I it think, for public it opinion. Sent shock other people seen drowning in those little dinghies and things. And I think that sent shockwaves around. Mm -hmm. And I think people felt, you know, we had to do something. And so Theresa May summoned me in again and said they proposed to accept the amendment, which I thought was good. And then, of course, they backtracked a bit. And the immigration minister had first said to me, we'll accept the letter and spirit of the amendment, which I thought ought to get us near to 3,000. Too few, but better than no figure. Absolutely. And, and then the government said arbitrarily, we're going to cap it at 480. Well, 360 and then 480. I said, why? And they said, because local authorities can't find any more foster families. And we disproved that. I mean, Lewisham, for example, uh, you know, and a lot of others have all, have all come forward and said, we, we, we can provide places. And in the end, through uh, NGO that I work with, Safe Passage, we, we, we got about 15, 1,600 commitments. So we said to the government, you know, this is not right. Uh, and and councils like Lewisham approached the Home Office, and, it, and the Home Office didn't respond. Hammersmith did it. Uh, and, and so it seems to be they were being less than honest with this 40 figure, which they still haven't reached. Uh, and it's pretty miserable. It's a pretty miserable response. That's for the children without family here. So initially it was for children without family here, child refugees in general were... Well, well that's because we already had the Dublin Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, the EU Treaty, uh, which allowed children with, with, with family here to apply to join their family. So we had, and of course the NGOs and the volunteers working in Cali and elsewhere were meeting both lots of kids because they were all mixed up. But, but, but so we already had that EU treaty to help and mine was intended for those that didn't have family here. 
The reason why I ask this and the reason why I have this interest, I guess, is a personal interest because I, my family is a foster family. I have three foster brothers who all were unaccompanied minors who came via the Calais jungle. Um, the first one, my Eritrean brother, Mez, he crossed the Sahara Desert, he crossed the Mediterranean, he lived in Calais when he was 12, and he arrived in the UK when he was 13 in 2015 after an incredible journey, and now has gone on to, you know, he didn't speak any English, and he is five years later, he's done his GCSEs, he's doing his A-levels. It's an incredible story, um, but he has a brother, a younger brother, who also left Eritrea a couple of years later, also fleeing compulsory military service, and he now wants to be reunited with his brother. So I'm interested into whether uh, he would be eligible and at what point he might be eligible along his journey to legally come to the UK ever. Well, the, 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 although the government have done the dirty on child refugees in the more recent, uh, in the more recent uh, legislation, that, the, the Dublin Treaty still applies till the end of this year, end of December. So I would have thought he would have a claim. The, his older brother is now what's still being fostered? Or still being fostered by my family. He's 17. 17. Well, I, I think that would be a basis for an application. The actual 28, 2018 Act said, you know, siblings, siblings would count as family, provided the family can accommodate the, the other boy. And this newest amendment uh, is specifically for children who have family in the UK already, The right? one the government are trying to get rid of, mm -hmm. and, and they've got rid, rid of uh, so far, uh, the amendment was to, was to say that when we left the EU, the government should negotiate to continue the provisions of that treaty. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, we've still got a year, although we've left the, leaving the EU tonight, alas, disaster. Uh, the, 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 the fact is that that provision the Dublin, still applies to the end of December, so there's still, there's still 12, 11 and a half months to go. So let's talk a little bit, a bit about that, because many of you may have seen that this amendment and child refugees have been back at the forefront of our minds and our newspapers in the last couple of weeks. Actually, just last week, it was all over the papers, right? Mm. So let's talk a little bit about what's been happening this last week. I know you have already, but for the oh. purpose of people listening at home. Oh. Okay, well, what happened was that we were, we were concerned, I'm going back a year or two, we were concerned that the Dublin Treaty might die a death when we've left the EU. So the 2018 Act, I moved an amendment in the Lords to say that um, the government should negotiate to continue that treaty even after we've left the EU. And that, we had a, quite a big vote and we won that in the Lords. The government accepted that in the Commons and we thought, well and good. You know, it's there and all we've got to do is to negotiate and there can be hardly any, any problem because it's just continuing something we've got already. Well, there might be problems, but I didn't think it was going to turn out the way it did. And then, just before Christmas, the government, after the elections, the government published a new withdrawal bill, which has now become an act, and in that they deleted the provision in the 2018 act that the government should uh, uh, make arrangements for, for the child refugees to join their families after we've left the EU. Mm -hmm. And that was deleted. And we couldn't understand why that happened. Everybody was absolutely shocked because what is more humane than children joining their families? I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it works because you don't even need local authority foster homes, you know, because if there's a family there, then, 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 then yeah. the children can, can simply join the family. And we were, I was really shocked. And the first time the minister phoned me up, uh, one of the Home Office Ministers, and said, well, we need flexibility. And I didn't understand why you need flexibility. It was a very simple thing, just negotiate to continue a treaty which is going, what, what flexibility do you want? So, uh, and then I had a, then I was summoned to a meeting with three government ministers, for heaven's sake, three Home Office Ministers, plus seven officials. So there were 10 of them, and me, against me. And uh, they were trying to explain this. And they went through a lot of excuses. It's, you know, it, it may seem very sort of uh, remote and we're just talking and sitting in, a, sitting in an office in a palace of Westminster. It's about children living in the most terrible conditions, children desperate to join their families, you know, children vulnerable to criminal, criminality, to trafficking, to drugs, or horrible, horrible, vulnerable young people, frightened and lonely, having traveled s such a long way. And that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not the dry, 
what I think of as a close 17 or close 37. It's actually about human beings who need a chance in their lives and who at the moment haven't got one. So, you know, one can feel, you know, I, I, you know, I vary between being very angry and being tearful about it because it's such a shocking thing. Anyway, they said, well, it's not in, it shouldn't be in the 2018 Act. I said, it got passed. Well, it, doesn't, it should be in something else. So I said, what? Well, it could be in the immigration bill coming along. Well, we haven't got that yet. How do I know we'll get it through? And they said, well, you don't need it, you don't, you don't need it at all. We, we just give you our word. We're, we're committed to bringing in children. So I looked at them. So they, they said to me, well, don't you believe us? <laughs> it's very difficult facing three government ministers. I said, look, personally, I believe you, but I don't believe the government. I said, I just don't trust the government. Why don't you trust the government? Well, every time we won the 20, in 2016 or in 2018, it was a battle. The government didn't want it. The, the amendments, and we had to fight the government and win despite the government. So, of course, you know, everything we've won for refugees, we have won by argument and, and, and by public uh, support and so mm -hmm. on, not because in your good grace you've given that to us. So, how am I supposed to trust the government? It's been an uphill struggle. So, when you, you're faced with these people that are making, because as you say, there seems to be one decision that is humane and the obvious choice to support child refugees reuniting with their family. And the other decision seems inhumane, shocking, and just straight up wrong. So it, when you're faced with people that are voting in this way, what do you really think is the underpinning, underlying reason? Well, you know, some of you have asked me that. I don't know. You should ask a government minister. When I said it to them, I mean, the reasons were, technically, it's, it shouldn't be in that, in, in, in that Act of Parliament. Anyway, you shouldn't put in an Act of Parliament the government should negotiate. So how do we get you to negotiate? Anyway, and, 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 and then they say, well, we can just, we're just committed to child refugees. Don't you believe us? So the one undertaking they gave was, in two months' time, a minister will stand up in Parliament and explain what's happening. And I said, look, we fought hard. We won debates in Parliament. We won votes to get where we are. We gave hope to young people because it's there in, on the statute book. And now you're taking it away without any assurance about anything. So uh, and I, you know, my view is that, that why, if you're not mean and nasty, why look as if you're mean and nasty? Exactly. Uh, and I have to be convinced you're not mean and nasty because this is a shocking, shocking thing to be doing. So I get quite emotional about it. So you know, I think, well, we, 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 all we could do in the end when we lost the vote and the, went back to the Commons, we, lo we lost the vote there. Uh, and I tell you this though, three government ministers, not the three I met, but three other government ministers came up to me and said, keep going, keep going with this, we're with you. We don't understand why the government are doing what they're doing. I said, why don't you tell them? And they said, it's above my pay grade, said one minister. And then a lot of members of the Lords and some Tory MPs have also said to me, they support this, they support a family union for child refugees. Uh, you know, so, but, but there was such discipline from Boris Johnson, much tighter than before, so that they didn't dare vote the other way. But I'm hoping that with public pressure, and this occasion is fantastic, just to help boost public, I mean, it's wonderful to boost public pressure. Um, I think with public pressure, we've got to keep at them. We mustn't let go, and, uh, and they'll have to concede something. They've already said far more under pressure than they said originally, when the only thing was, as I said to you, negotiating flexibility. Now they're actually saying, well, we do believe in family union. I said, well, we'll make a statement about it. But, you know, when you win an argument, you don't want to lose it just on, somebody, on a minister to say so. so. So the answer is, I don't know why they're doing it. I don't know why they're behaving like that. Some, somebody in number 10 has decided that technically they don't like, didn't like the amendment for whatever reason. We'll need to get someone on the podcast on the next episode to try and explain, maybe another minister who can try and explain why they are voting in that way. And... It sounds like it really has been an uphill battle that, as you say, you ha haven't had the support of the government behind you when making these amendments and putting these ideas forward. What is it that keeps you going with this? Well, look, i tell you what it is. It's people like the ones here. Uh, and it's the wonderful volunteers and NGOs working in Cali and working on the Greek, on the Greek islands and so on. There are people who are, you know, they are so passionate and they're so committed and they're so wonderful, and I can't stop because of them. So, you know, I, I feel there's so much, I've had so much support. Look, I've got the publicity, but actually there's so many people who've been doing the good work, some of them here, many of them here, but other people as well, and they've all been doing this, and it's, high, it's shown this high level of commitment. 
Uh, and, and just because I get the publicity, people think it's all me. It isn't me. It's not a solo effort. But I can't step away from it when there's so many people so committed to it. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that if people had experienced not just what you had as a child, but also going to Calais, what many of us here have experienced and going to Lesbos and seeing the situation there, that, that everybody would... Everybody would make the same decision, right? Everybody would support. Well, I think it's very hard if you've got, if you've got, if seen the situation in Calais or on the Greek islands, on it's very hard not to be even more passionate and committed mm -hmm. on behalf of the people who are suffering so much there, particularly the children. So it's, I, I, you'd have to be, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to be emotionally influenced by, by seeing what's go, what's going on. And I would love to take some of these government ministers with me and take them to to Moria camp in Lesbos and say, look, this is. These people have no hope. Can you give some of them just a little bit of hope that there's a better life and the UK can provide it for some of them at least? I've never said we can take everybody in the, in the refugee camps. After all, there are three or four million in Turkey and a million in Syria and a million in Jordan and so on. But I, I think we can, we can play our part and we can do more than we're doing and we can give particular priority to vulnerable people, including children. I could not agree more. Uh, talking of that, talking of our part, can we talk a little bit about what Britain has done in comparison or is doing in comparison to some of the other European countries, for example, Germany and Sweden? Well, well uh, look, there is, there is an issue about this. Now, Germany, I think Germany is wonderful. They, 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 but, but, the, but Angela Merkel asked other countries to play their part and share responsibility, and they didn't. Well, we did a little. I'll come on to some of the countries who are even worse than we are, if that's, if that, if that's possible. Um, but I, I think that there's a political problem, and we've seen it in Germany, where she was quite badly hit in the elections by a very right-wing anti-migrant mm. anti, anti party. And we've seen that in Italy, and we've seen it in, in other countries. And the worst, of course, are some of the, the Visegrad countries, that's Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Poland. Uh, and the Hungarian official position is, uh, refugees are not our problem, we only want white Christians. And that's a stated policy of the government. And the Czechs uh, are not better, and the Poles and, 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 and Slovaks aren't either. So we've got, we've got a one end of Europe, we, we've got people who are not willing to do anything. And then in the middle of Europe, we've got the Germans and the Swedes who have done pretty well. The Austrians are not keen. And we've got a resurgence of right-wing politics. And the right-wing parties cynically using the refugee issue as a way of trying to get electoral support. And unfortunately, some of them have managed to get electoral support in Italy, Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, Germany, and so on, which, uh, which is a tragedy, which is why I, I keep repeating, we've, in Britain, we've got to keep public opinion on our side. We've got to go out of our way to tell the public what's going on, why it's important, and that we're a humanitarian country, and so on. And uh, with public support, we can still avoid, avoid the resurgence of that sort of fascism. Absolutely. And how do you think, as individuals, we can continue to keep that public support? And what, what can we do as individuals? To well, first of all, we've all got to believe in ourselves and what we're doing. And that's great for today, because you've got, you've got a high level of commitment here. And we, we've really got to believe, as we all we do here, uh, that this is so important. It's a test of the sort of country we are. It's a test of whether we are humanitarian. So we've then got to let our voice be heard and speak out loud and clear whenever there's a chance. And of course, we're all the converted, so you know, and that's wonderful. Uh, but we've also got to talk to the unconverted. So I think it's important we, we, we lobby our MPs so that the MPs know there is pressure on behalf of child refugees, on behalf of family reunion, particularly. Uh, we need to talk to local councillors and get the local councillors on board. Now, Lewisham, Lewisham here, great. Uh, other, but, but if the MPs doing a good job, pat them on the back and say, well done. And if the local councillors doing a good job, pat them on the back and say, well done. But, but make, them, make it known that they are doing a good job and use your voice in any other organization, trade union, whatever it is, where you can actually let your voice be heard on behalf of child refugees. We've got to have that singing out loud and clear that that's where we stand and that's what we support. And then public opinion will be on our side, and public, I think it is now, and we've got to keep it on our side, and that puts pressure on the government. Amazing. Well, Lord Alf Dubs, thank you so much for being here as the first live podcast member. It's been a real, real pleasure. And 
This is uh, the 11th episode of the Worldwide Tribe podcast. If you guys are interested over the weekend, on your way home, or on your commute to work on Monday, or while you're doing the dishes, any of those times when you want to be listening to life-changing, incredible stories, then you can find the Worldwide Tribe podcast at, uh, on all of your podcast apps, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all of those places. So thank you very much for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, and can I say thank you, thank you, thank you for your your questions are pretty good, you know. You, <laughs> you, you, you could knock spots off the BBC and all these other people. <laughs> oh, well, I like I like the much. BBC, but uh, you, 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 you you could get on the news tonight tonight with that. I but appreciate listen, that. But listen, <laughs> But thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And we might have five more minutes, I think. Just five more minutes if, in case anybody else has any questions, um, then this is the moment. And I know no one wants I to think be the you've first. Dealt, you've dealt no with one it. wants to be the first one. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, Gawali. I, could have, I should have counted on you. <laughs> oh, yeah? Better than our episode. <laughs> Well, first of all, can I say it's lovely to see you here, and we, we've met on a number of occasions before, and your book is great, and I, I think you're doing a fantastic job. So thank you, thank you very much indeed for what you're doing. You're certainly helping the thing along. Well, look, first of all, as far as Brexit is concerned, <coughs> if we take just the legislation we've been talking about, uh, before we get on to wider areas, uh, I, I, th I think... Um, oh. I think a lot of this depends upon goodwill. You know, the, the children who haven't got any any um, family here and so on. And I think we need goodwill in cooperation with the EU countries. And my, my fear is that that goodwill may, may, may evaporate a bit. If we can keep the goodwill going, get the cooperation going. But actually, the cooperation between ourselves and France hasn't been all that good. And, you know, those of you that have been Calais, the, the, the young people there say, you know, the, the French police hassle us. You know, they take away our tents and our sleeping bags and so on. Uh, it is not good there. And when I went to a hostel run by a Jesuit priest in Calais, which they keep quiet about, for very vulnerable child refugees, and we, we had this discussion, and they said, well, and you may be surprised to hear this, they said, the French police treat us so badly, we don't believe the British police would treat us as badly as the French police. Uh, and so on, so it was a very pro-British pro police comment. Anyway, um, I think we've got to keep our sights on beyond Europe as well as within Europe. So firstly, I would like to see within Europe, even if we're not in the EU, I would like to see us work hard with other countries so we can get a, a, a Europe-wide strategy for refugees. You know, we should have the same, try and raise the minimum standards, uh, you know, the, the rights of refugees and so on. There should be uniformity, a better level of uniformity across all countries. And there are things that vary. For example, a child, when a refugee comes here, reaches the age of 18, and they don't have any security anymore. They could be sent out. In some countries, it's better than that. So I think we should have higher standards and a Europe-wide, provided sympathetic, a Europe-wide approach. Then we have to look at other countries, what the situation is there. But I have to say, um, the ones arriving in Greece, the situation in Greece is terrible. The Greeks aren't able to cope, and we all have to help help the Greeks to deal with this. You, you know, it's just putting all the responsibility on them, and we say, oh, well, it's too far away from us. So there's that, and then, and, and then of course we have to look at look at people in the in the region, and the people in the camps. We can't take we can, we can't take all those. I wouldn't suggest it because the public mightn't buy it. But we could do a bit more in looking at the vulnerable people. There is a small vulnerable person scheme, which is uh, about four thousand a year from the region, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon, and that's being extended for one year. That should be extended and enlarged, so we take more from there. And of course, let's not forget, there are a million Rohingyas who fled Myanmar and are in southern Bangladesh. 
Now, I'm not saying they could come here, but I'm saying we shouldn't forget that there are desperate refugee situations a long way away from Europe and the Middle East as well. Uh, and we have to be careful uh, not to, well, I think we should go out of our way to make sure that Bangladesh gets enough support. It's, I've, I looked at, I've been to the Rohingya camps years ago. It's awful there, and they're just hemmed in in a slip of land ne next to Myanmar, and they were treated very badly as well. So, you know, there are about 35, 30 to 35 million refugees in the world, and about 30 million displaced persons. Displaced persons being people who've found safety in another part of their own country. That's 65 million people. And you know, we, have to, we have to be aware of what's going on beyond, beyond Europe's shores as well. That's a very poor answer to a difficult question. <laughs> Lord Alf Doves, thank you so much for being here and fighting this fight and continuing to. We are all behind you. And yeah, I hope that you'll be around today to chat to people a little bit after this session if anyone else does have any more questions. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.